need to practice now since the flyby itself will happen almost instantaneously. Until almost the final day, Ultima will be just a few pixels across. For uh, Ultima Thule, it's more of a classical flyby where the object will show up being uh, resolved only days in advance, only to a few pixels. And it's really only the, the day around the flyby where you really get to see what the object looks like. There's a lot that's gonna be happening right around the encounter and we only have one chance to do it right. So we practice like it's the real thing now so that we get it right in the future. It's nicknamed the New York Times ORT since the hope is that the images and science will be significant enough to be featured on the front page of one of America's leading newspapers, just as happened after the Pluto encounter. With this operational readiness test, it's exercising all parts of the process. It's exercising the tools that the scientists use, the meeting schedules that we have set up, the communication paths that we have, and the product generation for press releases and press conferences. Of course, since the Ultima flyby is still not quite four months away, and MU69 is still just a tiny dot, the data they'll be analyzing in September is simulated, developed by John Spencer, Kathy Olkin, and others, using solar system objects that might resemble Ultima. Just as will happen at flyby, the different science theme groups adjourn to their separate rooms to access and analyze the data. The GGI team, Geology and Geophysics Investigation, is the largest. Confronted with images of what MU69 might look like, they start trying to understand the basics of the new world or worlds just encountered. We don't really know what is out there. We're flying into the unknown. We have never seen an object like this. It is the coldest and oldest and most distant object that any spacecraft has ever flown past. And as a result, we really don't know what to expect. The simulated images resemble what the 2017 occultation results seem to show. An object that's either a close or contact binary with a possible small moon. In this exercise, they start calling them objects A, B, and C. While having multiple objects might make Ultima more scientifically interesting, it would complicate navigation and targeting. What is the nature of the target? Is it a single body? Is it a multi-body? There's been a lot of debate about that, but if it turns out to be a multi-body, like a split target or a target with a large moon, it could complicate the understanding of the motion of the primary body, the one that we really want to take the most science from. If MU69 turns out to be a binary, like Pluto and Charon, both objects might be spinning about a point that's off-center. If we had that kind of situation, uh, we would have to make some judgment calls in the final days about which object to, to point at and so on and so forth. One goal of the ORT is to have the various teams interact. Veronica Bray from the Geology Group brings her hypothesis about the images to the Atmospheres Group. We've got two key questions for atmospheres. Um, sure. This is Pinka, yes. and so there might be a difference. So I guess keep an eye out if okay. you can, cool. and let us know if you see anything. <laughs> Members of each team focus intently on different aspects of the data, concentrating on deep analysis using their individual expertise. Some are skilled in developing software to help analyze the data. Others specialize in geological interpretation. P.I. Alan Stern moves from room to room, nudging the discussions along, carefully watching the process. Deep technical and scientific debates erupt, and soon the fact that the data is simulated seems forgotten. So ORTs are these weird environments where it's all fake data made up and it's not a perfect representation of the universe or MU69 in this particular case. It's kind of close, but we're creatures of habit. So when we get this data, we sort of fall into treating it like it's the real thing. And after a couple of minutes, 
we don't we lose sight of the fact that you know somebody might be trying to trick us no no, no we're taking this we're trusting the stuff that's in front of us and taking it as far as it's going to go they're taking this data seriously because unlike a mission where you go into orbit or you have a rover that's going to be there for a year two years three years to gather your data we're a special forces team we have minutes we have seconds to gather this data everybody wants to get all the information even out of the simulated data because they want to make sure that they can do it right when it comes time for the actual encounter think about it after 13 years of travel through space it's one moment that's why they take this so seriously every aspect of what will be happening at the flyby is being exercised Representatives of each science team gather with public affairs specialists to brainstorm what discoveries to feature in press releases and press conferences. We are now on the evening of January 1st, and we, we got our first data, yeah. and the science team worked with it for a few hours, and now it's 10 at night, and we're deciding what to have in the press conference and the release for tomorrow. We will be able to say that it worked Yes, the next morning. The next morning, an image goes out, and then we have a new image comes in. We run tests kind of a day in the life, a week in the life. Um, what's going to happen during, during the planning activities, during the maneuvers, the trajectory correction maneuvers, um, just to make sure we know who's going to be where, when, what data we're expecting, what happens if something doesn't come down exactly as we'd anticipate. Just as will happen after the MU-69 flyby, day two brings new data to add to the understanding of Ultima Thule. As with the actual flyby, some initial ideas are jettisoned and new ones are proposed and tested. Once again, the individual teams carefully digest the new information, discuss what hypotheses seem best and share their evolving conclusions. As with all the various ORTs, a key outcome is a series of lessons learned. For this one, they range from simple, making sure the sources and sinks of plentiful coffee are known by all, to reducing the number of meetings to allow more time to analyze the data. The operational readiness testing that we're doing really makes or breaks the flyby. Unless you luck out and everything just goes according to plan, you have to be resilient to, to, to surprises and, 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 and the unexpected. And the team has to be able to respond to those effectively and decisively. Um, so if, if, you're, if you don't do operational readiness testing, then you'll end up with a very brittle team that cannot uh, you know, respond effectively to the unexpected. But the real value here is we practice interacting and working with each other just a little bit more as a team and communicating and how to reach a consensus and discuss things know who's good at what it also teaches us more about what's coming and what are the types of data that we're going to get and the kinds of things that we really need to be ready to process and analyze when the real data comes in day three did the new york times ort succeed in capturing the front page of the new york times as the three days of intense analysis of the simulated data comes close to the end, John Spencer revealed what the actual data looks like so attendees can assess how well they did. Okay, so I want to make a few uh, concluding remarks at the end of this ORT. Uh, and let me start with this. Uh, three months and three weeks from today, we will be assembling in mass in this room, in this building, to begin the actual close flyby operations on the 28th of December. Uh,
formal nickname, Ultima Thule. Thule was this place that is far to the north, the most northernmost, coldest, most distant place. Although mythical, the island of Thule even appears on some medieval maps. Ultima Thule means beyond Thule, which means beyond the limits of the known world. And we're definitely going to a place that is beyond the limits of the known world. As to what Ultima will look like, even the world's best experts have no clue. It's going to be colors. It's going to be craters. It's going to be weirdly shaped. It's going to be a different kind. And we're effectively on the, in the crow's nest of New Horizons. It actually kind of feels that way. We're, we're out there, uh, we've got our telescopes looking ahead uh, for any sign of rocky shoals, anything that might, uh, might be dangerous to us. This object, Ultima Thule, might be at the center of one or 10 or 100 small moons or a cloud of dust. These are the things that we simply don't know and we have to know before we get there because uh, we're moving along through the uh, for 105 seconds, adjusting its velocity by about 2.2 miles per hour. That's a fine tuning of just over 1 15,000th of its 34,000 miles per hour. Tony is reporting nominal status, thank you. But even with the success of the Pluto encounter, this flyby is above and beyond any previous mission. For Pluto, we thought we were really pushing the limit and we were, this is even more challenging with Ultima Thule because it's another billion miles further out. It's considerably smaller. It's a very, very faint object. It's a little trickier getting to MU69 than it was to Pluto. With MU69, we observed it with Hubble Space Telescope, but we couldn't tell exactly its orbit in the sky. So we had to monitor it over time and make occultation observations of it. New Horizons is also four years older and its plutonium fuel is supplying less power. So it's been extremely challenging, first, just to get observations of it. But we had to combine something on the order of 48 images that are 30, 30 second exposures each to pull this object out of the star field. And since Ultima is 4 billion check, check. miles from Earth, signals to and from the spacecraft take more than 12 hours there and back, even traveling at light speed. It's a combination of the object being fainter, further, uh, we have longer round trip light time. Um, so the time, the reaction time uh, takes longer with a 12 hour round trip light time. With what little information that they have, they realize they're going to really have to focus in and pull this information out. It's time sensitive. So consequently, they're doing the push ups, the sit ups, the laps around the pool, getting ready for what's really coming. The details of what has to happen when are mind-blowingly complex. 
choreographing the ground operations to be done in time to get the images downlinked at lower data rates because of the longer distances, do the ground processing, get the information up in time. It's a lot more challenging for Ultima Thule than for Pluto. And Pluto was pretty challenging. So we're, we're shattering all the records really in terms of like every maneuver we do from here on out is the furthest maneuver ever done from earth for any mission. And so that we basically thread the needle as it's, as it said, and we hit the, the target, the aim point as we fly by uh, ME-69. It's an Olympics competition for brain power or something that could go wrong, something that will go right, unexpected discoveries. It's thrilling. I'm looking forward to some pleasant surprises and, and getting to, to see some science return, see what this, what this target really looks like. It's been years and years and years people have dedicated their lives to this mission. And now here it comes. And it's going to come upon us faster than we ever imagined. And I think the expectations are high. The energy is high. As Ultima Thule starts to reveal itself, we'll, we'll start to answer these questions. You know, is it a binary? Is it, does it have a moon? We can't wait to start this game. If all goes well, New Horizons will fly by Ultima Thule on January 1st, 2019. What kind of brand new world will we discover this New Year's Day? Will last minute hazards emerge? Stay tuned.
I know. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, University of Kansas. How do you hear me? I take it you heard that positive radio check? <laughs> and I think so. Well, Laurel, this is Rick Hale, live from uh, University of Kansas. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> uh, Hi, oh. Dr. Hale. It's so great to hear your voice. I'm so excited. It's great to see you. We, uh, we miss you here in Lawrence. Uh, you and I had a conversation in your first year on campus where you clearly said your intent was to be an astronaut. Uh, can you share with our students how you realized that vision and how you balanced your short and long-term goals to get where you are today? Of course, it's a good question. And I definitely remember that conversation. Um, and 
that was by far, you know, one of the things that was on the front of my mind when I was at the University of Kansas. Uh, when you say balancing short and long-term goals, though, it's kind of a hard question for me to answer uh, because my goals changed a lot over the course of my career, uh, which I think um, is quite normal. But I started my career with a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and that was work in aerospace and become an astronaut. But as I pursued that, um, pursued that goal, graduating from the University of Kansas and going to the commercial space industry, um, and then going back to grad school in propulsion, um, I was I didn't think that was the right path for me. And so I started looking, you know, for other options. And it took me a while, but the whole time um, I was learning about myself and um, about what kind of work I enjoy, my values, what kind of things I want to be a part of. Um, and most importantly, at all these critical decision points along the way, there were people and there were experiences that helped guide me to the next step or show me the way to the next step. Um, so yeah, so I've been fortunate and, and just as I followed those interests throughout my career from aerospace into ocean science, um, I was really fortunate to kind of compile this skill set uh, that turns out uh, is very helpful to being an astronaut. So as I felt like those goals were changing and being an astronaut was always in the back of my head. So it was always something I knew I was going to keep trying for and keep applying for. Um, but I had found a career that I was just so um, excited about doing and it was so rewarding. Um, so, you know, look at this point, looking back, it's very clear how all the decisions that I made, you know, kind of helped pave the way to get to where I am today. But at the time, um, I'll say that it definitely, definitely wasn't that clear to me. Um, but just to try to wrap that uh, thought up, um, I think having a big goal, like setting a big goal for yourself is important and it helps guide uh, the decisions you make and how you, leave your, how you lead your life. Um, but achieving that goal is not um, always the most value that you get out of it. It's all of these little things that you do along the way and all the things that you learn along the way uh, that really help um, build up you know, who you become and um, what you're able to do. Well, I'll share one more memory. And that was uh, in your undergraduate days when you had a microgravity flight. And I remember how excited you were about that. How does extended microgravity compare? Uh, well, I don't know. It's maybe like dipping your hand in the ocean versus jumping in the ocean, uh, but it's pretty amazing. Uh, being in extended microgravity. I have a really vivid memory of the microgravity flights that I did with Kansas, where, um, you know, as the plane started to nose over and do the zero G dive, I just like, just use one finger and like pushed myself off the surface and was floating. And it was just the coolest feeling. And now it's just, it's like that. And it's been like that for four and a half months. So I almost don't remember what gravity feels like. Uh, but I think the coolest thing about just being up here and getting to live in microgravity for six months is ha seeing how my brain has adapted um, and how quickly we learn to live in a 3D environment versus a 2D environment. Uh, like working on the ceiling like I just was would have totally confused me when I first got up here. I would have it would have taken me a couple minutes to, you know, look around and figure out where I am, uh, you know, when I wasn't in the same orientation that we train on the ground. And now I don't, I don't even have to think about it. You know, maybe there's a split second of confusion, but I kind of know instantly where I am in this three-dimensional space. Hi, Laura. My name is Matthew Turner and I'm a graduate student in aerospace engineering. My question is during your time at NASA, what was the most challenging aspect of your training? And do you feel this has translated well to your time aboard the ISS? Hi, Matthew, and thanks for the question. Um, there's kind of two parts to that answer. I think in the training leading up to this mission, the most challenging thing was just juggling all of the different um, training flows that we do and all the different commitments that we have to get ready for a space mission. Um, it leads to uh, really long days where you're kind of hopping between each subject. And so you have to shift gears really fast. And then you're also taking care of all of the you know, personal things you need to take care of outside to be gone for that long. And so just that, um, that volume of work and that 
uh, the diversity of knowledge that you're acquiring in that amount of time uh, was challenging leading up to the mission, but it directly applies and helps um, up here on space station because that's exactly how our days are like up here. Um, we're jumping between a maintenance task or a science task or you know an outreach event. And so we're constantly shifting gears up here and just juggling a lot of things in our heads as well. Um, so it so it helps get you ready for space. And then tech, like just on the technical front, um, I would say like the spacewalk training that we do in the neutral buoyancy lab has been some of the most challenging, but also some of the most rewarding training that I've gotten to do. Um, those days involve uh, working for about six hours underwater in the pool, um, training for a spacewalk. And it's physically tiring, it's mentally tiring, uh, but they're also the best days in training. And then also, of course, on orbit, um, getting to put all that together, um, just seven years of training, because that's one thing that we as astronauts come in with no prior, nobody comes in with spacewalk training. So we learn that from scratch. Um, so that's represented seven years of training on the ground um, and getting to put all that together um, and actually go out the door and do a spacewalk was uh, just a peak life experience for sure. Hi, Laurel. Uh, my name is Lauren Brinsfield. I'm a sophomore in aerospace engineering. And my question is, what are some other aspects of the training for being an astronaut? What kind of physical and intellectual tests do you have to complete both to become an astronaut and then to be selected for a mission? Great question, Laura. We do. Uh, so when we come in as um, astronaut candidates, they're called, uh, we kind of have a standardized flow where it's um, astronaut 101. We learn um, ISS systems. We learn spacewalk training, like I mentioned. We learn robotics, so how to operate the candidate arm up here on space station. We start studying Russian language and we start flying in the T-38 jets. Um, and we kind of continue all of that, you know, a low level amount of training um, through our astronaut careers. But once we get assigned to a mission, we revisit all of those different training flows and then also add in things like, um, like mission specific payloads, um, scientific payloads that we're going to be handling on board. Um, and then also things like MET, like we're, since there are no doctors, well, actually we do have a doctor on board, but we all also get trained as medical officers. Um, so you add in things like a me you know, medical flow, for example. Um, so, and each of those flows usually has some kind of an exam or just a knowledge gate, we call them afterwards. Um, and then for Soyuz, for the launch vehicle specific training, that's a little bit different. Um, of course, I did all that in Russia and that concludes with the qualifying examinations right before launch. Hi, Laurel. My name is Rian Reda, and I'm a senior in aerospace engineering. My question is, how different is it doing missions in space compared to training in a pool or other environments you trained in on Earth? Thanks. Well, the biggest difference is, of course, uh, the microgravity part of it. Um, it's funny, like once when we first get up here or when I first got up here, I found myself, um, you know, you're kind of work, trying to do your job, work on whatever it is you're working on in spite of the microgravity. So that's kind of this annoying factor that you have to take in. Um, you know, everything's bouncing out of the bag. When, when you put something in the bag, it just goes in and comes right back out at you. Um, or if you set a tool down, it doesn't stay where you want it to and things like that. Uh, so you're kind of fighting against the micrograp against, you know, this new environment because you have no experience working there. Um, but then as time goes on, you start to learn how to use it to your advantage. So now if, you know, I let go of something and it's drifting away from me, I can kind of look at it and judge if it's just going to hit the wall and come back and I don't have to move to go pick it up um, and just little things like that. Hi, Laurel. My name is Ellie McCarville, and I'm a freshman in aerospace engineering. My question is, what are some of your daily tasks that you have to complete, and what does a typical day look like for you? Our typical days, uh, we work weekdays from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. 
um, between those two times, the ground schedules all of our activities. So they're putting together the pieces of this extremely complex puzzle to make all of the science and maintenance work on board space station happen. Uh, we have exercise for two and a half hours a day, and then we usually have some time for lunch as well. Um, what the actual work involves, um, science and maintenance, it can be any array of science experiments that we have on board. So this afternoon I was uh, working on an experiment that's manufacturing fiber optics in space. Um, and then I was working with some cell cultures right after that. Um, the maintenance work is everything that you can imagine to keep space station running. Um, just after our evening meeting tonight, uh, we were having some problems with our toilet. So we were troubleshooting that. Hi, my name is Caleb Prescott and I'm a junior in aerospace engineering. My question is, please describe an area of science in which you are currently engaged. Uh, one of the areas that I've really enjoyed working on up here has been some of the life sciences and biology experiments uh, we're doing. I didn't have a lot of exposure to that um, in previous in my previous jobs, and, but I've really enjoyed getting to work in our life sciences glove box, which is actually right here in the module that I'm in, um, and working with different cell cultures. A lot of those experiments um, are flying cell culture, like human cell cultures, in order to study how the microgravity um, affects aging and the immune system in order to um, help us better uh, come up with treatments for diseases on Earth, as well as take care of astronauts. Um, cells age faster in the microgravity environment than they do on Earth, so it's a way for researchers to um, conduct those studies at a faster rate than they would be able to on the ground. Hi, my name is Chris Whitlock, and I'm a graduate student in aerospace engineering. My question is, I'm particularly interested in microgravity experiments, and I wonder if you can share any examples of unforeseen complications or interferences with running microgravity experiments on the station. Well, just like experiments on Earth, um, they don't always go the way you plan. And so we have a lot of uh, the same kinds of challenges that you would putting hardware together on the ground with um, interferences, like things not fitting together or something not working quite the way you expected it to. Um, and for those, um, it's really interesting for me because we're, as astronauts, we're the um, eyes and ears and hands of scientists and researchers on the ground. So uh, the experts are on the ground. We're not the experts in any of this. And so they are trying to talk us through, um, you know, over the radio, uh, what they think might be going on. We're sharing our observations and what we think might be going on. And so uh, together, we're trying to troubleshoot this equipment, and uh, that kind of adds a unique challenge, I think, to doing doing this research. Um, and it's those, but those are also some of I think the most fun days because you, you know, feel like you're really part of the research team, and you're actually you're really helping them with their research. Hi, my name is Shania Dorsey, speaking on behalf of Emily Harris, a sophomore in aerospace engineering. What has been your favorite thing that you've done on board the ISS? Oh, that's a that's a really tough question. Uh, I've loved I'm just having the time of my life up here, um, and it's been really fun. And we've kind of had chapters of our mission. Uh, we got on board, and we had the previous crew here, and they left, um, and then we went into. Um, a period where we were getting ready for our spacewalk and doing the spacewalk. And then we got a science mission. Uh, then we had the private astronaut mission, Axiom 3 on board. So each of those have kind of felt like little seasons within the mission and they've all had their highlights. Um, of course, doing the spacewalk was, was definitely a highlight of the mission. Um, getting to go out the door and do this thing I trained for for ages, uh, work that I love see the earth from outside, um, do the spacewalk also uh, with my good friend, Jaws, who I you know, trained with since I got to NASA and worked with the ground team. That was amazing. Um, just spending time in Cupola, um, especially late at night or early in the morning uh, when it's really quiet and just looking down at the earth. Those are some of my favorite moments. And then just hanging out around uh, the dinner table with my crewmates. I've got a lot of really good memories with them.
Well, uh, I'm Sam Ross, and I'm asking this question on behalf of Katie Patterson. Um, got a two-parter for you here. What do you miss most about being on Earth? And then also, looking back, what was the most difficult part of reaching the position you're in today? Uh, what I miss most about Earth is seeing my friends and family, and then I just miss things like weather, uh, rain and snow, jumping in the ocean, hearing the wind through the trees. Um, you know, up here, we just hear machine noise all the time. Uh, so just kind of those sensations of being outside. Um, and then as far as the most difficult part of getting here, um, I would say it's you know, probably just believing in myself um, and, you know, having the confidence, the self-confidence and belief that I um, belong and deserve to be where I'm at. Uh, that's definitely something that I've, you know, just kind of learned and gotten better at over time. And I think uh, what's helped with that is content, just continually challenging myself, um, just committing to a big goal, whether I'm sure I can do it or not. And then the experience of um, working really hard and fighting to reach that goal has helped, you know, eat with each of those steps, you get more and more confident in yourself and your ability to land on your feet, no matter what happens. Uh, hi, Laurel. My name is Danny Buffard. I'm a sophomore in aerospace engineering. My question for you is what element of pop culture do you miss the most while being on ISS? Sports seasons, movie releases, music, et cetera. Well, I'm, a, I'm not the best person to ask about this because I am awful at popular culture on the ground too. I'm never up to date on what's current, but um, I really like listening to music and also reading. Um, so I do a lot of both of that up here and we actually have pretty good connectivity um, we have brief periods of time when we don't have um, calm or, you know, basically Wi-Fi connection, uh, but we're able to stream music and uh, download books onto our tablets. So uh, that's what I like to do up here. Uh, hey, Laurel. Um, my name is Justin Vandevoort. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering. My question is, uh, what food from Earth do you miss the most? But I think the single thing that I miss the most is chips and guacamole. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to eat that when I get back to Earth. Um, otherwise, just fresh foods. We don't get fresh foods up here, um, except for when cargo vehicles come. And we just had one arrive last week. We had Cygnus come, and it brought us some blueberries and peppers, apples, grapefruit, and some ice cream. And it's amazing how when we open that box in um, our galley module, Node 2, how the smell just explodes out of the box and you smell the grapefruit and the oranges, like it's so citrusy and you smell the peppers and you kind of forget like that you've just been missing um, all of the, all of these smells um, when you're on space station. Also our coffee, uh, you don't, when you have a coffee in the morning, you can't smell it because it's in a bag with a straw. And so it'll be nice to have a cup of coffee that you can actually smell the coffee. Hi, my name is Jerome Miller and I'm a graduate student in aerospace engineering. My question is, how did it feel knowing that you were going to space? And then can you describe the emotions that you experienced your first moments in space? Yeah, my memory of launch day is one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite days of my life. and. Mostly, I just remember waking up with this um, deep sense of calm and readiness for the mission, ready to get on the rocket, launch to space, and get to space station and start this whole mission. Um, it was a really good feeling because in the days and weeks leading up to launch, you know, there's just all this stuff going on, um, and there's a lot on your mind. So it was nice to wake up with just kind of this clarity and sense of calm. Um, it was hard seeing my family that day just because um, I knew it was a tough day for them. I've, I've watched dear friends launch on rockets and it's simultaneously like the best and also the hardest thing. And so um, I knew, you know, a little bit about what was coming. And so it was just tough seeing them and tough knowing I wasn't going to see them for a while. Um, but yeah, launch was just amazing. We got on the rocket and 
uh, it's a lot like training. Once we're inside the rocket, you know, everything looks the same. We're running the same procedures. We're sitting in, you know, spa the same spacesuits more or less. And so um, it kind of just starts to feel like training until you get to the end of the countdown and suddenly the whole rocket just comes alive and everything's just kind of vibrating. And my crewmates and I all just like looked at each other with big grins on our faces because we're like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is it, here we go. Um, and then it's an eight minute ride to space. Um, once we got to space and um, we were in orbit, um, I just floated my pencil in front of my face. Everything was just kind of floating. We had some seagulls um, as our zero gravity indicators so that um, we had those kind of hanging. So the seagulls were flying around uh, and it's just hard for your brain. You know, you know, you're in space. You've been thinking about this uh, your whole life and it's still kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that you're there and everything's just floating. Um, it was pretty amazing. And then the other, and then of course seeing earth from space um, was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It was so much better than I had imagined. And then surprisingly also seeing space station, um, this incredible engineer, this incredible thing that humans built orbiting the earth and it's so big and it's just so pristine and beautiful in space. Um, it brought tears to my eyes when I saw it. Hello, my name is Ehikwai Ohizwa Banjoko, and I'm a sophomore in the aerospace engineering department. My question is, if you had to choose one thing you've learned or experienced on this journey that impacted you and wanted everyone to experience, what would that be? Thank you. Um, that's a good question and something that I've been thinking a lot about up here just as I go through the mission. Um, there's a couple things I think that I'm taking away from this mission um, that I that I hope to bring back to earth for myself and then also share with others. And um, a lot of it's just like little life skills, um, like mindful mindfulness. I know that's a buzzword right now, but uh, we have a saying up here, it's actually taped next to our workout equipment, that nothing is as important as what you're doing right now. Nothing is as important as what you're doing right now. Um, and I think on the ground, it's just uh, easy to get caught up in all the little things about ground life and everything that you're doing throughout the day um, and just forget that. And so, and up here, um, being in space station, uh, handling critical hardware, um, just working in this very remote and austere environment, that's super important for us to always be paying attention to what we're doing. Um, another thing is just reinforcing, it's really reinforced uh, the importance of good communication and relationships um, and continuing to always strive um, to improve skills in those areas. Um, tough times build relationships, but good relationships can also avert tough times. And that's definitely true uh, on space station. Um, and then just, uh, just the view from up here is something I would love for everyone to get to experience. Um, I've always, uh, for me, it's not really changed my perspective so much as reinforced uh, what an incredibly beautiful and complex and diverse planet we have, um, seeing it against the blackness of space. And it really gives me a sense of urgency to come back down to earth and play a part in making it better and I would just love for everybody to get to enjoy that view and recognize uh, what a space, special place we have to call home. Laurel, I'm mindful of our time. This is Rick Hale again, uh, but uh, Rock Cha. Uh... Rock Cha. I got my Jayhawk here too. <laughs> Time and safe travels. Thanks so much. These were excellent questions, and it was a blast getting to talk to you guys. And I'm looking forward to coming back to Lawrence after my mission. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Laura. We appreciate it. So.
we're going to make it. They were supposed to kind of something. 